Hello, I am Thibaut Solette, the Chief Researcher for the Adrianople Group, and today I'll be talking to former U.S. Ambassador Vicki Huddleston. She has had a long and storied career. She worked as a Foreign Service Officer in a number of countries such as Sierra Leone, Mali, and Mexico. She also worked for the American Institute for Free Labor Development in Peru and Brazil. She served as U.S. Ambassador to Madagascar in 1995 and 1996, and as the U.S. Ambassador to Mali from 2002 to 2005. She's the former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs. She also was the Chief of U.S. Interest Section in Havana, the Deputy Chief of the Mission in Haiti, and the Deputy and Deputy Director of Cuban Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Today we will be talking about security issues in North Africa and how they have been shaped since 9-11 and evolved from 1998 onwards to the present day. So, Vicky, I would like to thank you once again for coming on to the Geoeconomics podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. So, what kind of security challenges did you face when you were in North Africa, and when did these challenges begin? Well, the first security challenge was the biggest one, probably, because our embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were bombed on August 7, 1998. And at that time, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. And so this all landed right on my lap and that of the Assistant Secretary at the time, who was Susan Rice. And I think we were completely unprepared for something so, so major. And by these terrorists, who at that time we really hadn't heard anything about. Would you say that the 1998 bombing was the first time that Islamic terrorism prior to 9-11 came to the forefront of the discussion on international security issues? As far as I'm concerned, absolutely. So how did the security situation evolve following the 1998 bombings, and what kind of response did the U.S. government have? Well, it was a terrible wake-up call, because suddenly we lost two embassies, we lost uh, almost 300 people. Um, the, the embassy in Kampala, Uganda, was also under threat, and it was only really by very good luck that that didn't go up as well. And then many of our embassies throughout Africa were then immediately under threat as well, not only from Al Qaeda, but from uh, copycats. So we went through a period of uh, like six months in which, first of all, we were dealing with the tragedy of the people we lost and who were wounded, and, and really the survivors uh, in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam uh, trying to deal with, with their issues was making them secure, was helping them uh, come to terms with their losses, and uh, at the same time, uh, trying to understand exactly what had happened. And it really was a difficult time because the FBI really wasn't involved in international terrorism. And so, you know, they just passed on any scrap of information they had. Uh, we had Dick Clark, who was good, as the president's senior national security advisor at the White House. And he gave us a lot of help in trying to indicate what uh, terrorist threats he considered to be valid because he had been uh, looking at this issue of terrorism, uh, <clears throat> obviously for some time. Uh, and then we began this process of getting money from Congress, beginning the hardening of our embassies, which meant moving out of many embassies or buying property around them. It was a very, very difficult time, and we really were completely unprepared. After the attacks, was it discovered that the perpetrators were affiliated with Al-Qaeda in North Africa? They were affiliated with uh, Al-Qaeda, and bin Laden at the time was in Sudan or had just left Sudan. Uh, so it was an al-Qaeda operation, and they had been looking at plans of the embassy in uh, Nairobi, where the most families have done, 
for some time, it turned out. And the FBI had some prior knowledge. But of course, they didn't have enough prior knowledge or didn't think they had enough prior knowledge to really alert um, the embassy. Our ambassador at the time, Prudence Bushnell, was very concerned and wrote cables to the department expressing her concern about the embassy. On the whole, people wrote back and said, but there's so little we can do. You know, we pardoned outside, we extended the perimeter, but the only real security is to move the embassy, and that's a, quite a long process. So were there any attacks between the 1998 bombings and the 2001 September 11 attacks that would set the stage for the later war on terrorism? Um, I don't recall the date of the uh, bombing of uh, the um, USS Ole in Yemen, but I think that might have been before. I can't actually tell that. And then, of course, there were the barracks in Beirut, Beirut, which I believe was before. But really, as far as the terrorist acts in sub-Saharan Africa, for which region I was responsible and where I was working, there had not been any terrorist attacks in sub-Saharan Africa. So what was the response from the local governments to these incidents? Did they take the threat seriously, or did they want to downplay it and say their country was safe for foreign investors? Oh, no, they were very, very concerned. I mean, Kenya lost the most people. We lost, you know, like 11 Americans, but over 200 Kenyans. And it took down, you know, not only the embassy, but buildings around the embassy. So it was a very major issue for Kenya. And, of course, it had an impact on tourism. And, of course, they tried to deal with it, but they didn't try to, to downplay it. Nor uh, did Dar es Salaam, where actually the embassy uh, survived relatively well because the perimeter was greater. How did the security climate change, and how did popular opinion affect this change in the weeks and months following the attacks? Yeah, I mean, well, they were horrified. And they uh, very much wanted the United States help. Uh, we did uh, provide monetary assistance. We did uh, provide uh, medical assistance, brought some people to the United States. But I don't know, people, perhaps you can never do enough in these situations, even for our own people. A number of people, such as one family, the father who was the head of the consular section and his son, was working in the consular section, they both died. And I mean, that family has never really recovered and really feels as if uh, the State Department did not do enough. It, you know, in a, in a huge tragedy like that, it just changes everyone's life. And it certainly changed a lot of Kenyans' lives too. And Kenya and, and all of, I would say, Africa began to take the uh, terrorism a lot more seriously. So just three years after the embassy bombings came the September 11 attacks. How did 9-11 affect the security situation in the Sahel? Yeah, well, after those attacks, uh, on 9-11 uh, or terror attacks, the United States set up a base. It's only really official base. It has now about 4,000 people in Djibouti, and it's called Camp Lemonnier because it had been a French uh, foreign legion camp. Back on the wall, there's a great picture of a, foreign, a French foreign legion there that the Americans have, have kept there. So uh, we, we began to build up and staff this base that we obtained from the French and also, of course, with the permission of the government of Djibouti. The second thing uh, we began to do is the European Command, which was responsible for uh, East and West Africa at the time. Uh, uh, General, Fourth Star General named Chuck Wall, uh, began to be much more active in looking at what U.S. troops might do in Africa. And um, this is when I first came in contact with him because uh, I went to Mali uh, 
slightly after. Uh, let's see, when did I go to Mali? I went to Mali in uh, 2002. And uh, by that time, uh, uh, General Wall, the four star, was responsible for that area. I was very much interested in taking anybody he saw out. <laughs> I say that with kind of a, a chuckle because what happened is um, he was, you know, we were doing a lot of surveying for the European command work and he saw uh, what he thought were terrorists on horses and camels uh, with AK-47s up in the north of the Sahara near uh, Algeria. And uh, he sent down two generals and wanted to convince him to give permission so that uh, he could take them out. We didn't have drones at that time. He wanted to just have a long range missile from Rota, Spain, which seemed pretty crazy, or a bomber. And um, my country came and I said, no, you don't even know who these people are. You know, we don't know whether they're terrorists or whether they're insurgents or... Right, it could have been an absolute disaster if there had been some sort of an incident and innocents had been harmed. Yeah, exactly. And there's a book, it's a good one, Joshua Hammer, the badass a librarian for Kim that too goes into this um, tussle with General Law. So he, he couldn't get me to agree, and you have to have the ambassador's permission. He also wasn't going to tell the president of the country, ATT, uh, Amadou uh, Toure. Uh, so he went to the Pentagon. The Pentagon then sent the approval to the Department of State, which ignored it. But then subsequently, um, Algerian terrorists who were from the Algerian Islamic Army Captured 30 uh, mainly German, um, mainly German tourists in Algeria, and the Algerian army rescued 15 in Algeria, but the other 15 uh, they brought into Mali, and they were brought in by men who were called Al Faro, El, the Fox, <laughs> in Arab. And so suddenly now we really do seem to have uh, some terrorists up there. By the way, the group that Wall thought were terrorists turned out to be a group of Arabs being trained by an Algerian salafist, uh, Bel Makta, who became quite famous as an Al Qaeda operative subsequently. But they wasn't training them to fight uh, an insurgency to carry out terrorist attacks. He was training them so they could fight each other. There was a dispute over wells among the Kuntas and the Arabs. So Wall was basically grateful he hadn't carried out that attack. But when he saw that um, the car of Algerian had come into Mali with 15 hostages, then he was again pushing very hard to take them out. And again, I had difficulty with this. Not only because long range bombing can uh, result in much collateral damage, uh, and also we didn't want to make it one on one between the terrorists and the United States. So, what I was pushing for is that we help the Malians and the region to plan a campaign, and then if we didn't have sufficient military force to successfully carry out the campaign, against the Algerian South after a well on, then we could consider uh, an aerial attack. So I have a question. How long did it take for the Malian government to realize that there had been plans to do these bombings? And how did the government react afterwards? Well, they did find out about it not too long after. But they didn't say too much. They weren't very happy. <clears throat> but the problem is, um, the Malian government and the president, uh, ATT, was never that concerned about terrorists in Mali. His whole focus was on the separatists, the Turags principally, but also allied to some degree with the Arabs. 
because in the north of Mali, uh, above the Niger River, there's a population, say, 200, 300,000. They're all North African descent, or principally Arab and Turek. And they've always wanted to be independent. Ever since Mali gained their independence, they have been asking for independence, and they have, in fact, had three or four rebellions demanding independence, and unsuccessfully, alas, for them. Uh, but the you know, you can't win against a country of 11 million when you're so small. And also, northern Mali is hardly viable. But the mistake is that Mali North should have been attached to Algeria, which is a similar ethnicity and a cultural group. So these Arabs and Turks have never been happy with the Malian government or their participation in it, or quite frankly, being ruled by sub-Saharan black population. So right. after uh, trying to rebel numerous times, unsuccessfully, and uh, having a number of peace agreements, uh, including La Plama and Timbuktu, which, which I remember going to and all these great tribes and Arabs, you know, and their turbans, the blue turbans and their great swords. The senator was on camels, you know, welcoming the international community to celebrate, you know, this this truce that basically Algeria had a reign. So, ATP is worried, but not about the Algerian terrorists up there, who have. I'd like to interject for a second to clarify that the separatist groups in the north of the country, the Tuaregs and Arabs that they are Muslim, but they are not typical Islamic terrorists in the sense that we would think of somebody committing these acts for religiously motivated reasons. They are motivated by other reasons. Is this correct? So, and this is often a, a problem today. Um, initially, Mali separatists were not terrorists. And most of them today are not terrorists. They're insurgents. And they've had several rebellions trying to get uh, independent. So when Algeria, uh, the Islamic army, al Para came into Mali with the 15 German Turas, uh, they were not assisted by the Turas or the Arab population. But the government of Mali asked Iyad uh, Aga Ghali, who had been a leader of the rebellion to arrange for the payment of $5 million from the Germans in ransom and the release of the terrorists. So Aga Ghali did that with the Turek and benefited from it. At the same time, Aga Ghali was becoming increasingly radicalized himself. Did the response of the Malian government push them towards the direction of Islamic terrorism? Uh, to some degree. What, what actually, you know, had Mali really solved this earlier, it would have been, would have been fine. And, and the irony is, just to go back to finish this episode, so we gave Mali and the region under uh, General Walls, which was a good thing to do, um, intelligence, we helped them plan a campaign against uh, El Para, by now the, the, uh, the uh, tourists have been returned happily home, and Germany was $5 million poor. I had written the cable saying, now they're recruiting, and now they're buying weapons, it's a $5 million, what are you going to do? And of course, we all was back on the war path, but at least this time he was willing to try to work with the region and with the Malians. And um, so, we got the campaign ready. The Malian military moved up towards Kai, and then somebody in the military called El Para and asked him to move. <laughs> the Malians are not big fighters. And so El Para ran over to Niger, and because we had coordinated this campaign, the Nigerian military hurt and wounded him. Then he ran to Chad, and the Chadian military hurt him worse and after him, and he is today in Algerian jail. So this is a great success story. The United States and France helping the region with 
you know, not all, to, to, to advise on, to, to, advising, giving intelligence, and doing everything but fighting with them uh, so that they can take down uh, the Algerian terror. So that, that's a big success. All good. End of that story. Except then we fast forward to 2009. And during this time, uh, a new group has come to replace the group which El led, which is the group for Salafas Prayer and Combat, CSPC. The new group is Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. And um, under Obama, our policy changed. Uh, we no longer like to give them intelligence. Well, Wall never liked it because he felt they were leaking, and they did. Um, and since other countries like Chad and New Air weren't particularly good on human rights, we stopped working with the region. We're still providing equipment, uh, some degree of training, but we really weren't helping them to form a campaign. And our ambassador at the time was against it. She said the Malians couldn't buy anything. I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, but then I was responsible for that policy, and I was annoyed because I said, you know, they have, they have to do it themselves with our help. The only way they can do it themselves is if they have our assistance. They certainly can't, can't uh, develop a campaign. Well, unfortunately, the Malians never did fight. And the French got so disgusted, they began to work mainly with Mauritania, Niger, and Chad, which are much better fighters, not worrying so much about the lack of democracy in those countries. And so we we had already set up a group, and we've done this after um, the success against Del Paro. And we, it was, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It was... Um, a Sahelian task force of the State Department, of the, our military, and of the European Union, principally the French, and the region, and attempting to counter terrorists across the Sahel. This was not as successful. A lot of aid went in, but <clears throat> the French kept up paying ransom, about a total in the end of 80 million. The Spanish, the Germans, the Italians, the Swiss, the Canadians, all paid ransom. So Al Qaeda kept getting richer and richer with better and better ability to carry out um, terrorist attacks, live weapons. Uh, but it mainly engaged in uh, kidnapping up in the Sahara. So, and and so we we unfortunately at the same time we had formed Africa in 2008 2009. And the new head of Africa was not focused on terrorists. He said that his job that the Secretary of Defense gave him was to make Africa an acceptable in Africa. And so he would basically continue to carry out what the European and the Pacific commands had been doing throughout Africa. And he would concentrate on civil military. Well, at the same time, I am a number He said civil, civil military he was concentrating on? Civil, civil, military, you that? Uh, building walls, schools, uh, you know, uh, working out of Djibouti uh, with the local military in Kenya and Mali uh, to help them uh, uh, do things for, for the rural community. In fact, I was very uh, involved in this because I used the military money, not the military themselves, to go way up into the Mali and Sahara, and sink forages, uh, repair schools, um, repair clinics. And because I was traveling all over, way up in the Sahara, which nobody else would, would do, but, you know, the American embassy has more cars, more ability to do that. And also I had with me some special forces, because at that time we had special forces who wanted to learn about the battlefield. <laughs> so I didn't want them going alone, so they went with me. We'd go up to Timbuktu, we'd get the local military, we would pay for their gas, we would get in their Toyotas, pickups that we had provided, get their AK-47, 
And then we uh, take some local leaders, because the major leaders of these towns were at Nisair, like Bear and Tarawan, which are above Timbuktu. <clears throat> they live in Timbuktu. Life is better there. So we take them, we go up to these little towns like Bear and Arawan, sit down with the local leaders, discuss what's going on up there, ask them what they need, and then work with them uh, to get them a company to provide, say, a four rod. And at the same time, the special forces who were with me, they had medical boxes of medical supplies. We would hand them out around separately with the women who couldn't come into the men's group and uh, you know give them eye drops and Tylenol and bandages and so we were very popular up in the Sahara because we're the only ones up there the, the French ambassador never go up there his uh, security chief occasionally went up there I were, love there <laughs> oh, oh, were, there, were there civil uh, milita mi military operations effective in also reducing terrorism, or are they just, just effective in building up uh, populations with the population? Oh, well, they're effective in building up uh, relations with the population. In fact, what I was doing, which is a precursor to the civil military operations, which are actually carried out by our civil military personnel, because I was carrying them out with the local leaders and local businesses. Um, we're so popular that the Tureg leaders came down to Bamako, the capital of Mali, to meet with me. And I brought together the other ambassadors, uh, European principally, but also Algerian and surrounding countries, uh, to hear their stories. And these, uh, these uh, Tureg and Arab leaders that they really appreciated what we had done, and could we organize a conference of tourists, just tourists, so that they could discuss what they needed. And they said they didn't care what the Malian government came, but they uh, we just appreciate. So I went to the Malian government, the minister, the minister of culture was a tourist, and he said yes, and he got the president's approval. So we began organizing this big event, a big tour conference up in Timbuktu. And we had the use of a military aircraft. And we had uh, uh, special forces giving us medicines and, and other things. And the word went out. And two days before the conference, I was called into the Minister of the Interior and told that we couldn't have the conference that was called off. So I flew up to Timbuktu. I snuck out of my hotel early in the morning and took a four by four to see the tur eggs who were all gathered about an hour out of town with their camels and their tents, huge circle, their cooking fires. You know, it, you know, there were hundreds of them waiting for the conference. And of course, I have to say to them, I'm so sorry. But the Malian government won't let this happen. Why was the conference cancelled? Because the Malians are always afraid of the terrain. And so they were sure that, oh, if a bunch of terrains get together, they're going to make too many demands. Um, maybe they thought they would uh, conspire to carry out another rebellion. Anyway, they just got cold feet, cancelled it all, and here were these terrains who really, I think, for the first time, really thought they could put forward their manifesto on how they wanted to relate with the Malian government. And suddenly, you know, it's all gone. It's all canceled. And I think to this day, had the Malian government not canceled that conflict, and if we had been able to go through with it, we might well have avoided, which happened subsequently, which gets us now to the next stage, which is uh, when Libya blew up, because that's what actually blew up Mali. So moving forward, how did the Arab Spring, especially the security situation in Libya after the 2011 unrest, affect the security situation elsewhere in the Sahel? Okay, so what Omar Gaddafi did, and he was a good friend of 
ATT, the president of Bali, and he had been a good friend of the president, Conaray, the president before him. He provided a lot of assistance throughout Africa. But for Mali, he took the dissident Arabs and Arabs into his army. And so they were part of the Libyan armed forces. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, when we went to war, or the NATO war, and Gaddafi was defeated, you know, Gaddafi had just an amazing arsenal. Fortunately, he'd given up his uh, biochemical, most of them, uh, but his uh, his uh, conventional weapons, uh, RPGs, uh, handheld missiles, all this, he had an immense amount of, of arms. And so when he fell, the Turks and the Arabs came back to Mali with the weapons and began to try to get their independence once again from Mali. And this time, uh, they're called the National Alliance for Aswad. Aswad is the, that area of Mali. Uh, some of them uh, allied themselves with Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. And so the first attack and the taking of Timbuktu was done in combination with the Turks and, and was led to some degree by he had Agazali, the guy who did the first negotiations for the German tourists who had become radicalized. Uh, and so for a time, uh, the Turks and the National Alliance of Asawad and El he had Agazali's group called Written Blood were allied. And then they began to split apart, most particularly when uh, the Al-Qaeda began to move from Timbuktu and down toward uh, Severe and Sagu, and the French, realizing they were about to lose Mali, that the Al-Qaeda was going to gain a country, a caliphate, in fact, intervened. So with the intervention of the French, it pushed uh, Al-Qaeda back into the desert, broke them up temporarily, and dissolved the alliances uh, with uh, the National Movement for Ottawa, which remains separate from the terrorists operating today in Mali. Is this AQIM? AQIM, Al-Qaeda and Islamic Muslim. And are they separate from the main body of Al-Qaeda? Uh, they're, they're affiliated. Uh, you know, a local affiliate of Al Qaeda, uh, and run by uh, the leader uh, was most of the time Hammer was one of the leaders, but the leader most of the time was in Algeria. So this would have been towards the end of your career. Can you can you remind me when you retired again? Uh, actually, when I well I retired from state in more or less. 2006, 2007, that they called me back. Then I retired from defense in 2011. I see. So in the years following your retirement, how did the security situation evolve? And how does the security situation look today? Badly. <laughs> so one of the things I did, I just left defense. Uh, I was there for the Libya war, but I left uh, before Gaddafi. I think before they actually got Gaddafi, but anyway, uh, I uh, when the French intervened, the United States State Department was hesitant to help the French, and I wrote an article for the New York Times, which is why we must help Mali, and I believe it was helpful uh, because there was quite an outcry, and we began uh, w we refueled one uh, French uh, uh, troop carrier in the air. Uh, we began, and we began to train uh, West African troops to intervene in Mali uh, to stabilize the situation along with the French. So we began to get engaged in the military side uh, with, with uh, but, you know, this is a lot of history, but so what, what happened is, you know, the French did defeat them, but unfortunately, El Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb you, you can't really defeat anybody in the Sahara. You know, you're talking to 
3,000 square miles of desert. And at the same time, you now have Iraq and you have the growth of ISIL, the, uh, the Islamic, uh, how do the you Islamic say? State in uh, um, Libya and the Levant. Yeah, in Iraq and the, uh, whichever way, ISIS or ISIL. Yeah. And so ISIS and, uh, came into Mali at that time. So more terrorist groups began to proliferate. For example, Mokhtar uh, al Mokhtar, the Algerian, who was part of the Salafist army, who came early into Mali, who was training the Arabs to fight the Kuntas, you know, when we first began this conversation in 2002, by now he is uh, a very competent terrorist. And in retaliation for the French intervention in Mali, he takes out the Inaminas uh, oil and gas plant in southern Algeria. About 40 people were lost. So we're beginning to have a number of both uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda groups in Mali. They're beginning a resurgence in Mali. Uh, we we now have a, a first an African Union peacekeeping, then a United Nations peacekeeping. It becomes the most dangerous. It is the most dangerous peacekeeping in the world. The most effective groups are the Nigerians and the Chadians, who do so much to try to make <clears throat> uh, uh, safe. What makes the Nigerians so effective? So they've always been fighting. <laughs> I mean, they're just desert warriors, and so right. they, you know, they they fought in the Sudan, uh, you know, during Darfur on both sides. Uh, you know, there's little peace in the country, and it's the northern because you know that's the whole thing. The north of Niger, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, these are warrior class. These are uh, Tuaregs and Arabs. So, you know, they. Um, they live on their camels, they're nomads, they're fighters. Uh, <clears throat> they're not like the Sub Saharan Africans who have, you know, regular armies and uh, are not inclined to, toward being warriors in any case. So, Niger borders Mali. So, is there a danger with having soldiers from the region? who serve governments that have a vested interest in the outcomes of the situation, or does that make them more effective? They, they, didn't, they don't have a vested interest in Mali, if, you know, so, and they do have a vested interest in preserving their country, and they're well aware that Al-Qaeda, written in blood, and ISIS now operating across all of the Sahara, from Mauritania, through Mali, Niger, Chad, and into the Sudan. So they feel that their survival too is, is, is in jeopardy. So they have been extraordinarily brave peacekeepers. They've lost a lot of people. The French have lost a few. The Germans have lost a few. Everybody's lost some. The United States, although they're not part of the official peacekeeping, of course, we lost Four special forces in Niger. That's when the Americans are like, "What are we doing in Niger?" <laughs> so we're, we were trying to assist to train local forces so they can deal with this problem themselves. Because it now means that all across the Sahara, we can't enter that area, and that means that the, the Al Qaeda, ISIL, and the terrorists there have the ability to build up their forces and use the resources, which is mainly smuggling of people, arms, and drugs, uh, to uh, grow their movements. What now has happened, which is really, really tragic, is that Mali is falling apart. When I was in Mali, the Malians are very proud of themselves. They, you know, are like, we always get along with everybody. You know, the Tourays get along with the Koulibalis. The Koulibalis get along with the uh, Tarores, the Dogons. 
the Fulani, the Songhai, they all got along. The only group they didn't get along with were the Turegs <laughs> up in the north. But as far as the most of the population, they got along beautifully. This has ended now. What has happened is kind of a combination of things. The Fulani were always cattle herders. So although they were Black Sub-Saharan Africans, and they were along the Niger River, a little to the north, a little to the south, sort of Sahelian, uh, they didn't impinge upon the agricultural areas. But as the conflict has grown worse, and it's increasingly unsafe in the Sahara, and the northern Sahel, and as climate change has taken its toll, uh, Fulanis have done two things. Uh, they've moved south into areas that belong to uh, or were used by the Dogon, who are agriculturalists, and uh, some of them have joined an, uh, a Fulani faction of Al-Qaeda or ISIL. And one of those factions massacred Dogon, then Dogon's massacred them, and now we're having this continual communal violence in uh, the Sahelian Mali, unheard of, between not Turegs and others, but Fulani and the Dogon. So what recent trends have changed that may have made the security situation more difficult to manage? Okay, um, very controversial ideas here. Uh, one of the biggest is the Malian government's inability to fight and to take the issue seriously. They're always more interested in the Turegs than they were fighting uh, the, uh, the terrorists. They were also extremely corrupt. And the European Union, which loved Mali because everybody got along, put a lot of money into Mali because they got along so well, but they put it into the ministries, and the ministries are all corrupt. So you have essentially a state bottoming out with corruption, corruption from using the European money for, for their assistance to the uh, ministry, corruption from using money to put ransom to pay off the terrorists, and corruption from drugs, people, and arms that the government got a cut of being trafficked across the South. So a lot of responsibility on the Malian government. Not really a serious government. The second responsibility of the United States should have stuck with French, with the French, and uh, assisted the region, democracy aside, to uh, reinvigorate or reformulate a camp military campaign against Al Qaeda Islamic Maghreb. Uh, when we did it the first time against the groups of Salafat prayer and combat, we, the region was successful. The second time we refused to do it, nothing happened. They grew stronger. And then when Libya blew up and the Turks came back with their arms, uh, Mali fell apart. And it was only the French intervention that stabilized it. So, okay, now we have the French intervention. That's that's a good thing. We have an African Union, and then we have a, U a United Nations peacekeeping. But no foreign power is really w willing to peace make. And so the country just continues to deteriorate. And then, I'm, you know, we aren't resolving, you know, some of the perhaps basic issues which come back to colonial borders. The, the colonial borders don't work in Mali. Uh, the northern Mali and the Turks and the Arabs need to be in either an autonomous state or attached to Algeria. Uh, it's just not going to work being part of Mali, which is now a failed state. Uh, this same problem exists in the Sudan. And uh, United States and its allies are fit uh, to press the United Nations to allow the division of Sudan. Of course, 
So you have, oh, it's the opposite because you have the Arabs in the north of Sudan running the south of Sudan. Uh, but the black population in the south, they get their independence, and you have two countries. Unfortunately, this experiment so far has been a, uh, a complete failure as well. South Sudan is uh, violent, conflicted, and extremely corrupt as well. Are there any signs of improvement or positive trends that you can point to right now? I think Africa looks great. <laughs> but not the Sahara uh, and the countries you're talking about. But first of all, Ethiopia has done so much better. And they really took uh, terrorism seriously and never slowed around. Uh, and it was doing so well. It was one of the highest growth countries in the world. <clears throat> then they got a new prime minister. Uh, uh, Miriam, Haile Miriam, was a good prime minister, but then they got a young, new, dynamic prime minister who who, who made peace with Eritrea, um, who uh, uh, let most of the opposition uh, local insurgents out of jail. And it really looked like Ethiopia not only was taking off economically, but they were really doing something amazing on the political front to women and minorities. Unfortunately, um, an Amhara separate, uh, separatist group attacked, killed the Minister of Defense and others, and now the security in Ethiopia is very questionable. And what sadly has happened there is Ethiopia basically has been doing the right thing, but you get an ethnic separatism, and you know, the, the desire of certain people, certain leaders, to be the one in charge. And this is this is what you see happening in Mali. So clearly the president and the prime minister and, Ma and Ethiopia's leaders have to, I would say, take a step backward and look more at not only how they're going to do it, but deal with the ethnic rivalry, Amhara in particular, because they're the old traditional ruling group, but how to make sure that the country remains as a, as a single unity. It seems like a lot of these problems stem from the old colonial borders. Do you think that preserving them is a good idea, or do you think that there should be regions that should be granted more autonomy or given uh, new countries entirely? Or on the other hand, do you think that this would increase fragmentation and cause other problems in the region? Well, the lesson of South Sudan is the latter, more compact and more fragmentation. So here's what I think you have to do. I think you have to have something like a protectorate, a uh, United Nations protectorate, in word, which you have <coughs> France, most likely, because most of them are French colonies, uh, and with other countries, if France is not acceptable, or the United States or a UN envoy with power to actually uh, be the supervisor of the country's government for at least 10 years so that you don't have everybody vying for power, that you have to stop vying for power, and you have to have the military force to stop uh, those with arms, and these factional groups have a lot of arms and can ally themselves with uh, opportunists such as terrorists. Um, yeah, you. Have, it seems to me that the only way to make these new fragile states with no history of democracy, of viable units, is to make them first protect. It seems like creating a protectorate might cause some issues with neocolonialism. Uh, how would you answer some of the criticisms that creating a protectorate would be a neocolonial endeavor and would have bad incentives for France, the United States, and any other countries that would be involved? Well, obviously the African Union has to be leading the effort uh, with the United Nations, but you do need a Western involvement. Uh, and you do need Western military force. And you do need a United Nations and an African Union that has a military that can make peace and enforce peace 
that's not peacekeeping because unfortunately there's no peace to keep in Northern Mali or in South Sudan, for example, or even in uh, Somalia, which war has been going on now for 20 years. And despite significant assistance in the United States, Al-Shabaab continues to be rather, rather um, deadly. Yet the North, to go to another separatist issue, Somaliland, which was the English colony, wants to be separate. They actually was a massacre of Somali landers by Somalias. They probably will never agree to be part of a Somali state again. And other Africans are now slowly beginning to accept that because over the last 10 years, last 10 years, they've showed themselves pretty capable of managing their own government. Just yes, some land seems like, seems like it's a sick story because, because it's one of the safest regions within Somalia. Um, the other day I was looking at a, at a map of terrorist attacks in, 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 in Somalia. And, and what shocked me is that the, the whole country was full of, full of red dots. And each red dot, you know, is, is, is somebody who's been killed by a terrorist incident. Except Somaliland, which only had, had like a handful. And, that, and it seems like they have, they have better electrical and... Uh, in that infrastructure than the rest of Somalia as well. Yeah, and they weren't made in piracy either, like uh, Puna, which wasn't so much in, in, in uh, terrorism, but more, well, that too, but more in piracy. So <laughs> Somaliland would be a good experiment. They've done well. So let's send them an African Union, uh, UN approved uh, envoy. Uh, with a military enforcement that, that can oversee both economic and defense of the country and advise them for say, the next five years until uh, we see uh, elections taking hold successfully and then, you know, just phasing out. I think this would work for Spanish Sahara as well, Sarawi. Uh, I don't think on the whole it's a good idea to break up these states uh, because it leads to more break up and less viable states. Do you think that there is an appropriate market response uh, to this security threat and that there is a role for security companies like Executive Outcomes, Blackwater, or G4S to step in and help these governments? I, you know, all the countries have been against this. You know, the United States, the European Union, and Africa, for the most part, <laughs> executive outcomes are loose in Sierra Leone. Uh, and, uh, you know, the United States has used uh, military contractors always. Uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't see African countries using it too much. Because it seems like, especially with, with um, the current state, state of, of weakened, weakened militaries, that there could be some sort of, some sort of a, a positive role for uh, these, these highly professional and, and legally liable groups to come in. Although I see that could pose new, new security challenges uh, similar to the ones posed in the Congo crisis during the 1960s. Yeah, and how do you think that they work for? Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you let the Congo government hire them and use them on the opposition, which probably won the, the democratic, in quotes, election? So the problem is, you know, once you get into sanctioning the use of these uh, mercenaries, they can be hired by anybody, good guys and bad guys alike. But I see in Africa right now, in sub-Saharan Africa after the Sahel, uh, Nigeria, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, Uganda, Ghana, Senegal, uh, Nairobi, Kenya, Tanzania. These countries are doing well. They're really progressing and they're working together. We're beginning to see more and more the presence of these various countries working together to resolve issues like Sudan. Um, now you also see to some degree Africa looking more closely at what China's doing with China's exporting population, as well as the trade that China promotes is often in the detriment of African trade because they undersell African products. Uh, so 
I think Africans are getting smarter uh, about business, about investment, about holding foreign corporations and countries to account. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of good things in Africa where we don't have um, major uh, terrorist issues such as across the Sahara and Sahel or in countries like poor Congo or <laughs> Sudan, uh, which um, are states that have never been democratic and there are states that don't seem yet to have the wherewithal to govern themselves effectively. I think that would be a good note with which we can end this episode of the Geoeconomics Podcast. Uh, well, I would like to thank you very much for coming on to today's podcast and having such a great conversation with me today. Oh, well, you really know, it's fun to reminisce and think about how all this related, you know, beginning in 98 with embassy bombings and then 9-11 and then uh, we have the war in, in Libya in 2011 and, and you know, um, and then we have this uh, end game the tragedy in Mali and and uh, our inability with our current endeavors of peacekeeping to actually address the issue of how do you help states <coughs> form new entities uh, which uh, are more viable. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that was former U.S. Ambassador Vicki Huddleston. To find out more about her book, click in the links in the description below. The Geoeconomics Podcast is brought to you free from advertisements by the Adrianople Group. The Adrianople Group is a business intelligence firm that specializes in economic zones and international trade issues. We provide a wide variety of services such as due diligence, data gathering, cybersecurity, and investment attraction. For more information, visit adrianopelgroup.com or look in the description below. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode of the Geoeconomics Podcast.